RAF crews are trained in sea rescues, often responding to emergencies in the North Sea. Now, that crossing to Europe is one often enjoyed by amateur sailors and in fine conditions can be an exciting adventure. But the weather can change dramatically, conditions transforming in minutes. And it was a ferocious North Sea gale at the height of summer that led to this incredible rescue mission. Late one August afternoon, the RAF search and rescue crew at Leckenfield was scrambled to investigate a mayday call from a yacht called the Molly Louise. We knew where we were going. We didn't know how many people were supposed to be on board. They quickly located what appeared to be an abandoned yacht. Molly Louise, rescue helicopter 128, channel 16 units. We found the yacht Molly Louise, and she was just pointing and running back towards Hull. Even though the boat is apparently under control, underway, there's no answer on the radio, and we get to the point of wondering what now is actually going on here. The yacht was motoring towards the mainland, but apparently without a crew, something was wrong. An hour earlier, skipper Rob Barton, his son Dave and their friends Dan and Adrian were travelling from Holland to Hull when they were hit by Force 8 gales. Suddenly, a freak wave smashed into the side of the yacht. Everything went quiet and very cold and I realised I was under the water. I thought we were sinking. I've got this, a very clear memory of being underwater um, entangled in ropes and just all kinds of things that got obviously washed over the deck with us. The wave had swept Rob, Dave and Adrian overboard. I had the handheld VHF in my hand, so I said, Mayday, 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 we're in the water. And then a big wave swamped us, it broke over us, uh, soaked the, the radio and after that it was defunct. With no idea if their mayday had been heard, their best hope of survival was for the fourth crew member, Dan, to turn the yacht around and pick them up. But he was an inexperienced sailor and unable to turn the yacht. I picked my way up to the radio, grabbed the radio and called mayday, mayday. And then I realised that the light had gone out. I couldn't communicate. I remember looking, looking over my left shoulder and just seeing the boat um, and it just disappeared over um, over the back of an enormous wave. Dave, Rob and Adrian were cut adrift, stranded in the freezing North Sea. Their chances of survival minimal. But Rob's original mayday had been picked up and the RAF were able to locate the Molly Louise. When Dan appeared on deck, he used hand signals to communicate. And eventually I said, there's three men overboard way back there there are three people over the side approximately half to three quarters of an hour back we're told that three people went overboard about half an hour ago um, which of course changed the entire dynamic of the whole thing when we heard that it was oh shit frankly uh, a human head in the water is a very very small object and the ocean is a very very big place I've been on dozens of searches for people overboard in the water and I have never before found anybody. There have been three air crewmen killed on search and rescue duties. They were all winchmen. Earlier we heard how the RAF search and rescue crew at Leckenfield had responded to a mayday from a yacht in the North Sea. In treacherous high seas, three men had been washed overboard. They were 60 miles from the coast, being tossed about in freezing waters, and they had no idea whether or not their mayday had been heard. The three men overboard were the skipper Rob, who is a GP, his son Dave and their friend Adrian. They'd been in the water for 45 minutes. By now, their chances of survival were minimal. I've been on dozens of searches for people overboard in the water and I have never before found anybody. The three men were in a desperate situation. I held on to Adrian, David held on to me, and, and all we could do was hope and pray. 
the waves were sort of breaking behind and all you could do was just hold your breath. And by the time you'd, you'd sort of come back for air and, and sort of sort of spluttered a bit, there was another one breaking. I remember looking at Adrian, his eyes were open. Um, but he was very pale, very white, and he had this, this sort of surprised, maybe, look on his face. In, in the water, it's hard to um, obviously resuscitate somebody, but we shook Adrian, and there's no response. I've seen death quite often in my job, and, and um, I, I was certain that he'd had a cardiac arrest. Knowing that Adrian was dead was one of the worst moments of my life. My dad and I had this conversation about Adrian. Um, and with my father being quite religious, um, he said a prayer for Adrian. Um, and, we, and we let go. In a sense, you, um, you let go physically, but I think you also let go mentally. So because his presence, um, his present was quite difficult, and then I suppose as soon as he'd, um, as soon as we'd sort of said our goodbye, if you like, um, it was maybe it was our our turn to try and um, try and survive. Throughout their ordeal, father and son were battered by the high seas. They were becoming hypothermic and had very little chance of survival. Slowly, slowly, I think you just started to think um, it's all to no avail. This isn't going to work out for the best. Um, almost resigning to the fact that that was going to be it. There was no sort of hope. In between the waves, we talked quite a lot about life and death. And uh, not to be frightened of death. But he kept on saying, no, no, think about your grandchildren and think about Joan, my wife. After about an hour, I, I could feel my systems sort of closing down and I was drifting off a bit into unconsciousness and I remember David saying uh, dad dad don't go don't go there's a helicopter and uh, I turned around to to have a look we couldn't hear it because of the noise of the sea and I, I thought it was a vision one of the guys in the back called target sighted three people in the water absolutely fantastic. The casualties had been spotted, but to rescue them, the winchman would have to be lowered into breaking 20-foot waves. It was an incredibly dangerous operation. There have been three air crewmen killed on search and rescue duties that I knew of, um, two on operations and one on training, and they were all winchmen. He's the guy taking the biggest risk. The first thing I remember seeing is a, um, a bloke on the end of a cable um, getting lowered into the sea. Um, one of these enormous waves um, just um, hit him. On the way in I was hit by two or three waves and the first time the rad saw he looked down and all he could see was the cable coming out the top of the wave. He was getting um, sort of battered around by waves yet he was still signalling to the guy in the helicopter that he was um, that he wanted to, you know, to keep sort of sending him down. Winchman Dave battled to get Adrian out of the water first in the hope that he might be revived. You want to get to him first because you don't know if he's just gone under. And it may be if we can get to him and drag him in, we might be able to bring him back. As the helicopter crew attempt to resuscitate Adrian, Winchman Dave went back for the others. The son's words to me when I got down there was take him first, meaning his father. He was semi-conscious at that point so I was placing the strops again and we got hit by one wave just as we were getting the second strop in place which flipped us a bit and that seemed to bring him back to life and he started grabbing at things then. The reason I couldn't take both of them together was if I lift them on one strop each the blood will rush to their feet and they'll die on me but if I lift them in the horizontal the blood stays in the centre of the body and their body will equalise again they'll be fine. We're drifting at probably a rate of about 15 knots with the wave speed. So the aircraft's having to try and match that speed of the wave movement and keeping the cable and moving with us. And if at any point, as each wave came through, we sort of whipped away, you've got to do all that work to get back to them again. So once you're in contact, 
you do everything to keep hold of them. You use your legs, your arms, anything you can to get contact. And once you've got it, you don't let them go till you've got the straps on. I remember being winched to safety. I can't describe the, um, the sudden change from, from being um, full of despair to, to full of hope. You know, the difference couldn't be bigger. You know, on one hand, you, you're thinking, uh, this, this is it, the, you know, this really is the last thing I'm, I'm ever going to do. To actually having a, a new lease of life, having a, a sense that, um, you know, you've, you've, um, you've beaten the odds and, and, and you, you're going to survive. Dave and Rob were rushed to hospital for emergency treatment. Tragically, Adrian's life could not be saved. But the rescue mission was not over yet. Fourth crew member Dan was still aboard the Molly Louise. She was on autopilot and being thrashed about in the gales. By now, the RNLI lifeboat had arrived at the scene. She looked a mess. You could tell she'd had a, a, a real good brushing. So she, she wasn't going to last long, one good wave, and, and, and she, we would have probably lost the boat and, and, and Dan. This lad jumped off, uh, off their boat onto me. And then I was so relieved, I, I just I just started crying uncontrollable, you know. I'd, oh, thank God for that. Two of the RNLI crew flung themselves onto the Molly Louise, but getting themselves and Dan back to the lifeboat was a far from routine task. The transfer of the casualty was the most perilous. We was in amongst all the bad weather now. My biggest worry was the fact that the lifeboat coming down onto the yacht before we'd managed to get him off or anything. The lifeboat weighs 40 odd ton, and if you get that coming down on a, a, a 10 ton yacht, you're gonna kill it. A particularly larger wave picked the lifeboat up. I thought, if you come down, I'm gonna come down on top of these three people. As we're coming down, the yacht laid away 90 degrees. It nearly went right over onto its side. And as the lifeboat come down, I'm not 100% certain, but I think we hit the keel of the yacht, which stood the yacht straight back up again, put the two decks level like that. My crew was left on the boat. Dan and dragged the casualty across. He was aboard the lifeboat. I think somebody was definitely smiling on him that day. It was a horrific experience for Rob, Dave and Dan, who have had to come to terms with the loss of their friend. But the fact that any of them survived is miraculous. The guys that rescued us of this, um, I suppose this enormous, um, this almost um, superhuman sense of, or amount of courage, um, bravery, um, they almost seem fearless. They would say it was just a day at the office, but it's a very, very dangerous office. Where you say people think that I'm brave and whatever, any other winchman on any other flight would have done exactly the same, because that's what we're trained to do. So any one of us would have done the same thing and gone out three times that were required, because that's what we're here for. Winchman Dave Stanbridge was later recognised for his bravery and awarded the Billy Deacon Memorial Trophy by the Duke of Edinburgh. But it was the skill and dedication of all the crew, both RAF and RNLI, that made such an incredible rescue possible. <laughs> <laughs>